Hey guys, how's it going? Average Swans listening music YouTuber here, and uh, today we are back with the Swans discography review, and not just back, but it's over. It is over for Swans. This is the last video we're doing of this this year. I decided that, I think like during the recording of the last video, but I decided that because I got a lot more things to do this year that I planned, and I just want to get it done. And also, I have some purchases to make before I finish the Swans discography. Um, and also, hey, you guys had to wait like 14 years for a Swans reunion, so I don't want to hear it, okay? Uh, we, 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 uh, I'm, I'm, it's just going to be like less than a year until I make more videos about Swans. So, But that doesn't really matter much because today we're going to be talking about Swans some more. Uh, and, and we're going to start with uh, their second to last album before their careers ended for a little bit. The Great Annihilator from 1995. Some would argue this is a great album to start with for the band. It is certainly a relatively accessible sound for the band. It's got a pretty good dosage of everything they do. Nothing's too long, nothing's too necessarily abrasive, but the themes, oh my goodness. It's called The Great Annihilator, referring to just the end of the universe. Um, a, real, a real bright one. What's cool about this album is I have no idea what they're going to do after it. I mean, we all know what happens after it, but yeah, no idea. And it kind of picks up where we left off on Love of Life, of having these crazy textures, uh, having these little interlude parts, uh, and having just a really unique sound in general. Um, but also pulling from the better songwriting, I think, of White Light from the Mouth of Infinity, um, as well as the deep pessimism of that album. Um, this is not another Love of Life. This is closer to White Light from Mouth Infinity, but we get a more post-punk sort of rock and edge to the whole thing. And if I had a say in the matter, Swans at their most rockin' is like my favorite. Um, it shows in their live albums, it shows in their live material that their rockin' stuff is really what shines. But we begin this album with a track called In, which is just a brief little intro track, but what it does is, is very atmospheric and uh, impacts the album a lot. It starts with these crazy rolling toms and various noise textures that I, I couldn't even begin to discern. And after just this wall, this swamp of noise, you end it with uh, a sound of a child laughing. So, uh, Swans being cryptic has not ended here. Uh, in fact, we're just kind of getting started. Which goes into the track, I Am The Sun. Which Swans loves their uh, sun imagery here. We had Goddamn The Sun off of Burning World. Um, we had mentionings of a sun on, on the previous couple albums. But, but I Am The Sun is, is a new one. It's one of their craziest songs. It's got this crazy stop-start sort of gothic sound of the whole thing. It is absolutely monumental. It reminds me a lot of the first two albums of Swans. The way it's just hard hitting and then silence. It's not as atonal, that is for sure, but you get something that is lurching and very atmospheric. The clean vocals are also a, a total change of pace and they feel very ethereal until, of course, this song compositionally breaks off into a totally different section. It is a song that is chilling and hypnotic. It is like being blackout drunk and talking to God. It is that uh, just chilling. It's actually just about someone who is like narcissistic and spreading their own evil. Um, kind of interesting from like a sort of like religious perspective there. And if this album wasn't weird enough already, this ends with 40 seconds of claps and kick drum, which just swans being experimental with just how they compose things is one of their greatest strengths. Um, and also just the sheer size of their compositions. I love how big they get. And this goes into the track known as She Lives. It's got these giant isolated drum and guitar hits. And it's very cryptic in what it actually means because it's about celebrating a woman who's losing her mind actively, which, I mean, we know Michael Jira, like, isn't a person who's, like, evil necessarily. So, like, whatever this perspective is, is, like, so warped. It also matches a lot of The Great Annihilator. A uh, Great Annihilator has very nihilistic point of view, wanting the death of the universe. It wants evil. It wants darkness. It's so warped. It also has these mourning, almost crooning... Uh, keyboard sounds, which are, are totally bizarre. Reminds me almost of some stuff off of like Children of God. And this all transitions, uh, it does a hard pivot into these morphing, droning guitar lizards. This transitions into these morphing, droning guitar layers that hit hard as a truck. And this goes on for the remainder of the whole seven minutes, just this very Nick Cave type of sound. 
And then honestly, we go into one of my favorite Swans tracks, Celebrity Lifestyle. One of the grooviest, most rocking, almost danceable tracks. It's it's a very catchy one. It's been in my head since the first listen. It has a very haunting way of criticizing Celebrity Lifestyle, which is uh, it's cold and bitter and cynical. And I think like instead of like Song for America, it, this is like a much more nuanced and much more interesting perspective. It's also way more bitter. It doesn't feel as edgy. And Compositionally, it's got these two chords that feel like they're stabbing the whole song the whole time. It's got the most aggressive guitar tone. It's really insane. And next is a song they would actually use in later albums. This is Mother Father, which has these crazy effects shooting off as we get a suspiciously groovy track, something really alien to Swans. And Jarbo's vocals are just soaring as we get one of those danceable beats Swans has had uh, in their whole career thus far. I think it's more danceable than anything off their last two albums even so, uh, it's, it's, it's something so jagged and interesting. And it's about the duality of the forces of the universe that create and destroy, which is, it, it kind of reminds me of some stuff off the last two albums where it would have like a conflicting, like brutal pessimism in the lyrics, but like a really positive sound on the actual music. Um, it kind of does the same thing here, but in a way it's even more nuanced than that. And up next is actually a real highlight, Blood Promise. Now, I don't know what they did in the studio for this track, or at least on this version, but every instrument is given such a weird, bizarre recording process, um, or maybe some extra tools used to change the sound, but it sounds medieval. It reminds me of like some Nico, some neoclassical dark wave. It's crazy. It is a very artistic depiction of conceptualizing Jesus's sacrifice. It is a very powerful song. Oddly enough, it is floating and beautiful. It's one of the craziest sounds on the whole album, as well as one of the most moving uh, lyrically and thematically. And if you wanted more on the groove train, we've got the track Mind, Body, Light, Sound, which is something I can remember the chorus from the very first listen. It's very groovy with this huge floor tom that fills in on the whole beat. So it's actually deeply moving. Got a bit of an uh, electronic body music to the whole thing. I actually I actually put this on a dance playlist. It's a super spiritual track. I honestly think it beats out anything on Children of God. It's about the contrast of existence and non-existence. It is trance-like and groovy and another highlight off this album. And up next is the track My Buried Child, which is just hypnotic and rolling, kind of indicative of later Swans material. Uh, the, the cosmic forces on this album really don't stop thematically and sonically. And we get Jarbo singing here, uh, a very beautiful passage which kind of coasts off and leads us into the B-side, which begins with the track Warm, which is a very rare composed song for Swans as it's just an instrumental. Um, they do have their interludes that they had on Love of Life, and we will get to some instrumentals on the next several albums, but that's pretty rare for Swans uh, so far. And this is a really cool sort of textural sonic adventure going through piano and guitar and it's swelling and getting bigger and bigger it keeps adding more and more layers it's a great way to introduce us to the b-side and the next track is alcohol the seed which is is cool kind of sheds light on swans's sort of mentality at the time we hear a lot about michael jira sort of as a child sort of with his experiences and you'll hear about his experiences even on later albums but you don't hear a lot about them during this period which i encourage you guys to watch some swans documentaries um i'll probably talk about them at some point um, they're, they're very interesting and like you don't see a lot about them until you actually go and watch these But this this was revealing at the time that Michael Jira, I, I believe was an alcoholic um, But this is a track that sort of digs into That sense it's it's kind of glorifying it in a way that's really twisted It is the opposite of the introductory track warm. It is gross and heavy It is hypnotic and rolling and just slamming it reminds me a lot of children of God material the way It still has some industrial remnants I remember when I used to talk about Deftones and how they'd always have a song about them being Deftones and it got kind of really annoying once it was done for like the second or at least the third time. Uh, but Swans talking about them being Swans doesn't happen that much. And here it's literally just about how alcohol fuels this era in a way that is like nuanced and ironic and just just really kind of nihilistic. Uh, which when has Swans not been nihilistic? I guess in, on future albums. But here is it's their peak of nihilism, truly. And up next is the track Killing for Company, one that led me on a personal uh, spiral of research because it's actually about a real murderer uh, from uh, Britain. This was uh, Dennis Nelson from Scotland who actually uh, was a gay man who was an alcoholic who, which contrasts with Michael Jira, uh, the alcoholism part, who would basically take people's lives um, of other men 
and keep them around as company for a while. And uh, dude was sick and twisted. If you want to read about his Wikipedia article, um, and, 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 and he died uh, several, several years back, um, but like dude's perspective was just crazy. Uh, and it feeds into a lot of the themes of the song. He, uh, one of the biggest things that happened is when he finally got caught, uh, cause, uh, they found like his drains clogged, super gross stuff. I don't want to get too graphic. Uh, they were like, so, uh, why did you do all that? And he was like, I was hoping you'd tell me, um, like, and, and a lot of his perspective was like, he couldn't ever help it. The dude was seriously just a, a, a nutcase in all honesty, but like that, that those themes are very present in the song, which while it starts actually rather pleasant as at least for the, the themes involved, it switches halfway through to this just gross churning guitar section. And it coasts out with this lethargic and hollow and almost numbing part to the whole thing. It's almost like you're painting the dude's life in a song, which it's, it's, it gives you a not very pleasant feeling, I'll tell you that. And up next is the track Mother's Milk. It opens up with this light guitar and a lead vocal passage from Jarbo until it thickens up uh, just completely. It's cryptic and haunting. It's almost like the stuff off of uh, the latter half of the industrial era where it was just like droning with Jarbo in the background, especially the more piano-led tracks. It's a cool one because it's, it's kind of Freudian in nature, but it contrasts sexuality with love and hate. Uh, one of the more deeper conceptual Swans tracks and definitely indicative of what would happen on the very next album. And up next is the track, Where Does a Body End? Which opens up with this reversed speech uh, from Michael Giro, you could tell, but it's it's very trippy. Uh, and then, uh, despite that little brief intro section, becomes one of the most immediate Swans tracks to date. Uh, no funny business. It's just straight, straight into it. Which follows, actually, the death of the whole universe and how it's like you're watching the whole thing. It is a completely haunting track. Uh, as, as well as just one of the most dense tracks. There's like, you can tell there's a lot of mass in this thing. It's almost like stars collapsing. And this goes in the track known as Telepathy, which is similarly thick to a lot of this album, but it has a more subdued sound overall, which is a track that is insanely cryptic, just asking what is real the whole time, which is turns into this almost progressive build of snare rolls and various building textures, which the, the biggest one is the organ, which sounds like funereal, of like the whole world. It's got this really numbing hypnotic effect to the whole thing, which this album has been very strong with. And what's crazy is this, this album is such a good encapsulation of all of Swan's career up to this point, um, almost minus Children of a God in terms of a thematic standpoint, but from a uh, sonic standpoint for sure. But you've got everything about this album is like so just gross, it's not fun, it's like harshly angular, it's calling back to every era, even though uh, the next album is even more call back to every era. And then you're going to go into like the seer, which is legitimately a callback to everything. That was the whole point of that album. But here you have all these things together and I'll, as much as the B side is just all these gross songs and kind of an intro to these themes. Uh, the, the B side, you've had all these tracks leading up to the end of the universe and it, a side is like the reasons to end it. And the B side is it's over. Uh, which leads us into the penultimate track here, The Great Annihilator, which is penultimate. It's not the end, but it is the end. It is just cosmic destruction. And it is absolutely welcoming the whole thing. It is just twisted. It's as hypnotic as anything on the album. It is just so twisted, it's crazy. And the structure is just rolling and surging ahead, and then it all stops. You think it's done until the whole thing just revs the engine one more time and just keeps going. It's almost like like yeah like your final moments are just panning out again but like the whole thing is just it's the a side of the album you know it's just the, the the reason for the destruction and this leads us into the final track out which the opening track was in now we're on out which is actually a, a double bass and horn instrumental it's ominous and strange uh harshly contrasting with the rest of the album as it is peaceful serene and quiet it's it's almost like an argument for death which is um, like, like, like Swans conceptually knows how to make you hate yourself. Um, and like, like, like a white light for the mouth of infinity is just like, I myself have done everything wrong, but great annihilator is everyone ever has done something so wrong that we deserve this, um, which is like kind of based, but you know, some final notes here. This album is about the cruelty of every single sense. It's the cruelty upon yourself from yourself done to others from others 
and at the end from the universe or is it even cruelty from the universe sounds like you deserve it it is just the most apocalyptic album ever uh and and i, I will say i've never listened to this album on good speakers um it's all it's all been these babies right here uh but it's such a glacially huge thing that i think it would be better in that sense um in a full listening on like vinyl uh but that being said this gets a high come to brazil it is it's not my favorite as it doesn't like stare you down as much um but i'm sure like swans is so radical that really all their albums are like living on a wire's edge you know you change something just a little too much and the quality gets thrown off they're they're kind of fragile but at the same time they all feed off of like a vibe like that's the way swans could be so good live even though they do different renditions of their own songs. So I definitely wanted to cover that album in a previous video, but I that would have just made a previous one too long because we're kind of we've kind of reached the final leg of this discography. Um, you know, Great Annihilator is literally about the end of the universe. Where do you go from here? Um, your band is actually falling apart. Like Michael Jira and Jarbo are dating but they're struggling. Um, the members have been up in the air for forever now. They've got a bunch of backup material. They have so many live albums and compilations that it's like even hard to count. Heck, that's why I've been reviewing like at least one every video, which is like the crazy part about this whole thing. I mean, I even omitted the live track for um, Filth that's attached to the Filth live album. It's like a 20 minute recording, like unmixed any of that of just Filth material. Um, so, so where do you go from here? And this is when we enter the soundtracks for the blind era if you will now i think it's really annoying when people are like oh i'm in my brat era i'm in my i'm in my uh midsummer era i'm in my a24 era i'm in, I'm in whatever uh but a24 is a little bit of a better thing to say than those albums because a24 is a whole company of a bunch of different movies that are better different they're just all artistic um now swans actually went through eras um like I know a lot of modern artists will have like an album cycle that includes a music video and a single and the album itself and remixes and a live tour. But Swans, uh, they, they capitalized just as much really as like a popular artist, which is weird because they like by no means should be popular due to just how abrasive and angular they are and how harrowing their song topics are. But they really took advantage of that, you know. After their first four albums, uh, or actually their first two, really, you went to Greed and Holy Money, then you have Public Castration, and then you have Children of God, and then you got the live album there, as well as the Children of God single that came before that, as well as the only music video in their whole career. And then, of course, you go into Burning World, which they have various singles off of, including a uh, Joy Division cover, which I didn't really mention, but it's a level tear us apart, and it's not my favorite. But Jarbo does an excellent one on her own. It is my favorite version of that song. So Swans has all these errors to them. None is more definitive than Soundtracks for the Blind, because the whole thing starts off with an EP called Die Tour ist zu, which is German for The Door is Closed. Now, I could just go on and on about this EP, because it's literally the length of a full-length album. It's like 40 minutes. Um, and... What's crazy is, so I, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna start talking about Soundtracks for the Blind right now. Soundtracks for the Blind is not a perfect album. It has a lot of fat. It is their longest album. It's like two hours and twenty minutes long. Detour is Zoo is like a huge sampling of that. It starts off with uh, Ligeti's Breath, He Flows Kind, which is um. And, and, and this kind of starts with the sort of concept of this EP. As you notice, that title is in German. Uh, two of these songs are in German. This one is a song that already is on that album. It is Helpless Child, but it is extended to 21 minutes long. You must be thinking, wow, that must be the best song ever. Um, true, but not for the reason you think. It is basically Helpless Child with a couple other tracks cut up and stitched to the beginning. How Helpless Child has like a two minute long intro of like droning and all this craziness. This track has other bits. It includes bits of the very creepy Beautiful Days and the equally as creepy I Love You This Much um, stitched onto Helpless Child, which I could just describe Helpless Child now, but I will actually do it later where it actually matters in Soundtracks of the Blind. But this is a 21 minute long gargantuan track here. It is the longest track of their career until 2013, I think, or 14, whenever the seer hits. Um, actually, uh, 2013, when we rose from the bed with the sun on our head, when they would start extending their tracks to even longer. But 
fantastic lifting experience to kick off this whole thing. And it really resembles a lot of what Soundtracks for the Blind is gonna do. And after that is a German version of the song All Lined Up, which is a fantastic track that we will be talking on the album. It is a highlight on that album. And then you get Surrogate Drones, which is a sort of piece together sort of drone bits that are show up on a couple times on that album, which it actually shows up a lot. There are a lot of sort of collage style tracks there. And then you have YRP, which is a track off of, I believe the Young God EP, but it could be Cop. It is it is a live version in which Jarbo sings on. Um, real early Swans track. It, it's, it's your property, just kind of interpreted for the modern sense with more pleasing textures, but just as harrowing stuff. Um, it sounds really sick. I don't remember if it's this version exactly that shows up later, but it's it's here now. And then oddly enough, there's the track You Know Everything, which is the only one I'll really go into. It's a bonus track from Love of Life, and it sounds pretty, pretty different for this album. It has this really heavy pounding, almost orchestral rock section that is uh, preceded by the sample of a child speaking, which is a lot like some stuff off of Soundtrack to the Blind. Um, not quite though, it's, it's a little bit different and it throws it off just a little bit. And after that is MF, which is a rendition of Mother Father, the Great Annihilator track, but this one is acoustic. It's a really crazy, weird song, especially with Jarbo singing over the whole thing. Uh, it, it's a cool vibe. And to end the EP, which is crazy 40 something minutes long at this point, is the track Sound Section, which is a live rendition of the song The Sound, which shows up on uh, Soundtracks for the Blind. It's one of the biggest songs there, one of the best ones there. Um, and it's cut really short. So I know I've been kind of shooing away this EP, uh, but you finish this thing and you ask yourself, how did we get here? And then I was wondering to myself, no, this is not how we got here. This is what Swans has been meaning to do this entire time. These themes are so much more pressing and personal and nuanced. It's confronting oneself in a way that is nuanced and contrasting it with all these different parts. The sort of all encapsulating view of this career is great. This EP does feel unfinished though. Sound section, come on, you can't leave me hanging like that. Um, but what we're about to get into is far more twisted in five times more disjointed. And I won't lie to you, that was a great listening experience I had. I finished the whole thing and I was like, whoa. Um, you could have passed it off as a full length album and I would have gave it like a low eight, honestly. But then we have Soundtracks for the Blind in 1996, opening with the silver side, and I'm gonna forget it, but the, the other half of this whole thing is Copper. Now, this is an album that, looking at all the track names, as individuals feels really weird. It doesn't even make sense to me um, because probably about half this album is like actual songs, but the other half of these tracks are like collage bits, some mattering more than others. This is a very atmospheric and bleak experience, but going through every track on an individual basis is not the way to listen to this thing. The way to listen to this thing is in a, in a bit more of a ambient experience. It's, it's hard reviewing this one because you know, you've probably heard of this album. A lot of people call it like one of the best albums of all times. Even if you've heard it yourself, you might agree, but it's not out of consistency. This is one of the least consistent albums I could think of because it is literally cap capturing the entire career. There are even recordings on here from before Swans was even a band. Um, just sound loops from when Jarbo was like a child or them recording uh, like their parents. Um, so I'm, I'm going to try to be as brief as possible on some of these tracks and talk about more about the feeling as a whole at the end. Um, and, and spoiler alert, I'm not even going to give this one a rating. It's just, it's too hard to. It's not an album to listen to like that. It is not an album to have a normal listening experience with. Believe me, I've tried to have it a couple different ways and I end up kind of missing something. But honestly, the best way to do it has been driving to someplace in my car, having the volume louder than I thought it would, and then some random uh, just b-side just sucks me in and you'll notice a lot of these songs never show up live in fact after the next live album i don't think any of them do but we open up with red velvet corridor which represents being born um which instantly introduces us to the very present theme of the album and something that seems to contextualize michael jura's entire life birth and his mother you will see so much about this. And as in De Tourist Zoo had those sort of three collage tracks for Helpless Child, 
we have a much extended version of that, even though that was as one track there. This is like three tracks in a row that builds into each other. And Red Velvet Corridor starts with this crazy slide guitar sort of droning. Um, it is a really cool atmospheric opening to the album. And it goes into the track with one of the best song names I've ever seen, I Was a Prisoner in Your Skull, which this this album is intensely bitter, um, and you can tell from that, but at the same time, you're going to notice it is also intensely self-hating and reflective. It's in a way that is has so much self-blame for these things that people can't even control. It begins with this really chilling, ethereal drone sound, and you have Michael Jira making these blah, blah, blah noises. Uh, at least I think it's Michael Jira. He's just sort of mumbling to himself in this crazy way. And then you get the one of the loudest, most abrasive rock parts that Swans has had up until their career thus far. It's It reminds me of like that second track off of Great Annihilator. Um, or, but it's, it's just so explosive. It just like kicks off and is going and then it dies and then it does it again. And it does this very iconic hard transition into a recording of this criminal who is actually being secretly recorded by the FBI, but he knows it. And his words are so crazy. Like, uh, uh, listening to like a post-rock album, you could criticize something like Godspeed You Black Emperor, um, like um, Slow Riot for Zero Canada, where it has that dude who's just talking about like he has to pay a parking ticket but he doesn't believe in the government or whatever and I listen back to that and I'm like I don't I don't know how intelligent this really is I mean it's cool for sure and it's very real but something far more visceral is right in front of me right here you have this guy who's talking about things that are so seemingly random and then he loops it all together talking about how he like you might see him as this person who's just a criminal and this horrible person but you are the one who's truly messed up. And like, like he shouldn't have even known he's being recorded. Like whether or not he even found the tape, he and it, it sounds so focused. It doesn't sound like he's talking nothing. He knows exactly who he's talking to, which, I mean, I'm talking to a camera right now. I'm, I'm literally rambling to myself, but hearing this guy do that with such actual emotion, because he knows what he's talking about is, I'm not going to say commendable because, I mean, I don't know, he did committed a crime of some sort, but it's it's so deeply visceral. And with all this weird conceptual stuff, we go into the track Helpless Child, which is what you're here for. You're opened up to two to three minutes of droning and craziness and strap in because the song's like 16 minutes in length. Uh, you get this very simple two guitar chord opening as Michael Jira starts singing one of his most tender and soft songs so far. Um, which is full of bitter notes. Everything about it is intensely caustic. It is like bleach. The way he sings about a mother and a child, and basically what you get from it is someone who, as a child, was like, is suffering from fetal alcohol syndrome, but like, like worse than that. It's almost like someone tried to uh, end their their unborn child's life due to just drinking too much and then uh but but the the child survives and is born um with this serious sense of bitterness um it is you've never seen michael jira so vulnerable but more interestingly you've never seen him want to not suffer so much this is like one of the few tracks he's had that he struggles where so you look back on your filth injured cop, injured greed, and your holy money, your children of God. And it's him placing blame on all these different concepts in his life. Um, and, and that's why I love body to body, job to job so much is because it wonders how deserved that whole thing is, at least from a listening standpoint. And here he asks himself, you know, I've, I've definitely done something wrong in my life. I've deserved this at this point, but how did I deserve it then? Uh, and then uh, we're going to answer that question sort of later. Uh, it's really interesting, but it builds and builds until it has the, he stops singing eventually. And then just, it's, it has this crushing orchestral sound. And then it keeps going with the two chords. Um, actually, it adds a third one in there as it just loops on and on and on. And then this descending key melody from Jarbo comes in. And you, you're just sobbing at this point. You are just chilled to the bone. It is absolutely hurting you. Uh, and actually, um, I just I just listened to Lowe's first album recently. Uh, it almost feels like this is an answer to Lullaby. Like you could probably stitch those two songs together in some way and make a deeply harrowing experience. Um, 
not like Helpless Child isn't already. This is one of the best Swan songs ever. This is one I've returned to all the time. It is so just insane. And this goes in the track Live Through Me, which is this cold track that is filled with effects all stitched together with this folky acoustic guitar line. But the whole thing just feels broken. It is another interlude track. It's one that you listen to and you wonder what's going to happen next, which is the track Yum Yab Killers, which is a live track, actually. It is very low fidelity. It sounds striking, but it's just this pounding, like this ground and pound rock track, which is actually not rocking very much. It feels primal, uh, primeval even, and it's just Jarbo like screaming her head off. Uh, and it's just pounding forward and forward, and it's about this idea of actually killing babies oh and uh eating them it's lo-fi and very upsetting it's one of the least uh gosh it's like one of the least self-aware swans tracks ever um like it's fully aware like you know this you just listen to helpless child but it pulls you out so hard it's incredibly jarring it's uh and, and like you can't tell what half the things jarbo's saying because the recording is so low fidelity and that is one thing that's crazy about soundtracks of the blind is that it's literally stitched together like none of this stuff should be together from an objective standpoint um like it doesn't fit but you have jarbo just screaming over all this stuff and this goes in the track the beautiful days which contrasts very heavily as there's a t little recording of like a baby jarbo singing about the day being a beautiful lovely day and then it stitches itself into a recording of a phone sex worker talking about her life um and then, and then these dark ambient synths just come in. Like, that song is one of, like, the worst things ever. Um, it is artistically fantastic, but the, the, the artistic standpoint of Swans is just, like, look at how easily corruptible society is as a whole. And the crazy thing is just, like, the recording of the sex work is just so dejected. Like, she doesn't even care. Uh, like, like, she, like, she could tell, you could tell there's, like, fight in her, but, like, She's just like, yeah, this whole thing's like, whatever. It's like, 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 look at, look at what people were. It's like, we, we, you, you almost wonder if things have to be this way. And this goes into a very iconic track known as Volcano, which is sort of a response to celebrity lifestyle. It's, it's cause it's about someone trying to get into a celebrity lifestyle. It is maybe the weirdest song on this album, but like due to what we have here, is it really the weirdest song on this album? Uh, like, if you show any other song to a random person, they'd be like, that's the weirdest song I've ever heard. But compared to all those, this is the weirdest song you've ever heard. Because this is just, it's it's a danceable beat that just sounds wet. Like, it literally sounds like it is dripping, sopping wet. It is gross. Some people compare it to, like, mid-era coil, kind of, when they were doing more of the EBM stuff. Like, um, think of something like Anal Staircase. And Jarbo sounds way too pleasant. And comparing to some of the tracks off of, like, Love of Life or White Life and Mouth Infinity, she she sounds, you can tell what she's saying. You can really tell what she's saying. And it's not cryptic at all. The lyrics are very, like, like they're very present. Like, they're, they're so much easier to tell what the, the symbolism is. And that, that sort of, like, lack of nuance actually makes the song, like, stronger than any of that. This goes in the song known as Melothum, which is this acoustic guitar instrumental that feels just barren. The whole thing falls apart entirely. And this goes in the track All Lined Up, which is on the EP, which I'll actually talk about its structure now. This is a song that kind of reminds me of that one-off Great Annihilator about the murderer. This is one about, like, doing the deed. But, I mean, I, I know when it's swans, it's like, what does doing the deed really mean? But, um, well... You have these chimes with Michael Jira like moaning in the background, which I know that doesn't answer the question at all. And you have like like one of the scariest things you'll hear until like 2010's Swans. It is him singing with this very distorted, atonal, almost modal set of chords here. Uh, and he's singing about uh, all these people he's kidnapped, which still doesn't answer the question. You still wonder what Swans is going to do. But it's it's about it's about ending people's life. It's not about the other thing. Uh, but he has this like crazy dejected thing here, and you know this track could have been totally fine with just that, and it could have gone into another song. But then you go into the hardest hitting rock section Swans has had up until this point. It's it kind of reminds me of um it reminds me of I was a prisoner in your skull. The way those like snare rolls are hitting like crazy. It's it is just so intense. It, it it really sucks you into that own feeling 
Uh, and then the whole thing repeats for a second time. It is an amazing song. It's like some classic, like brutal, no wave stuff. And this goes into Surrogate Drone 2, which you've probably noticed there's no Surrogate Drone 1 yet. It's yet. That shows up later because they switched it around for some reason, which after all lined up is just a droney, dejected, and apathetic instrumental. And this goes into the track How They Suffer, which is, is one of the center points of this album here. It is about Michael Jira and Jarbo's uh, dejected and dying parents. It is about Jarbo's mother who has dementia and Michael Jira's father who is legally blind. You hear them talking about it and you've got these this ambient instrumental in the background, but like th this is literally a recording of both of their parents talking about it. I mean, everyone talks about um, Michael Jira's dad being, I'm what you call legally blind, uh, but the worst thing is Jarbo's mother. She says, when you're asleep, you can't tell whether you're asleep. Uh, which is just one of the most horrifying things on the whole album. Um, and the craziest thing about this track, it was recorded years earlier. I think Jarbo's mother passed away by the release of this album. Michael Jira's father, I don't know if he was still alive. And this goes into the song Animus, another actual song style centerpiece of this album. It is about 10 minutes long. It's got Jira croaking over this uh, guitar track. It sounds misty. And, and a little bit wet. It's talking about existence and your own pain. And it kind of conceptualizes this album really easily when it says that uh, the gr your greatest motivation will be what you hate the most, which is as cryptic as the song is, that line, that sort of idea really sinks in. And it is vast and expansive and actually feels very hollow for swans. You know, it doesn't feel as dense or thick. And you could tell there are various layers of instrumentals, but it feels like there's a big middle section that's not there. And that's actually what ends the A and B and I think C side? I don't know, I think this is a triple album. So you, you've got uh, some more room to go, which leads us into the side of Copper, which opens up with Red Velvet Wound, which uh, unlike Red Velvet Corridor, this track is very different um, and it's not drooling at all, which it's interesting seeing like the contrast between like Corridor and Wound, like one, is negative uh, in sort of an objectification sense, like literally just like reducing the humanity, and the other is like showing the bitter hatred. And it's this cool sort of low fidelity recording of Jarbo singing this like almost like carnival sounding song. And the whole mix just swallows her up. It sounds uh, certainly really, really interesting. I, I will be honest, it's not my favorite track here, but like a few of these haven't been my favorite track here. I mean, I could do without Mellow Thumb. But then this goes into another centerpiece of the album. Um, probably the last big centerpiece of the album. This is the song known as The Sound. It is totally parallel to Helpless Child, but it is just as devastating. It's got this crazy organ sound with these really spacey guitars over the top, and it's all progressed forward by a lone pounding floor tom. There are these short and beautiful lyrics about his mother. It is beautifully poetic. Um, like, it's really cool is that he talks about her being behind a door that he could never enter, and he said what lies beyond is the sound. Um, which, whatever that even means, I could never even picture. And what leads us into the huge climax are the lyrics, you despise, I love, which talks about, it's definitely about his mother and uh, how just, just horrible she was to him. The post-rock part uh, gets, twists itself and gets noisier. Um, it doesn't lead you out for the entire rest, but it gets bigger and bigger and bigger until it just stops. And Michael Jira is singing again, which, is a crazy lyrical moment because he says, mother, you were wrong, mother, I was wrong, which that's the answering to help us child. It's, there's the blame right there and you don't have to justify it. You don't have to make sense of it. It's simply there. He's simply blaming himself. And if you're waiting for it to thicken up, there it is. It's the chimes come in and the various ambient textures. It sounds insane. And next is a song, Her Mouth is Filled with Honey. It has these more twisted chimes, but it is no longer sampled. After the sound, it is straight emotional turmoil which while not like a centerpiece of the album by any means, it shows this really cool perspective of a young girl having turmoil from her animus, as Freud would say, which is such a cool uh, reference to earlier in the album. And this goes in the song Blood Section, which is, is another example of how just weird and like nonsensical this album is, because it, it brings back the goth swan sound. I It sounds like something off of Great Annihilator, but it actually sounds rather happy instead. It feels so weird and bizarre as it leads us into hypo girl which 
like like so copper and silver here they both i in my opinion they mirror each other they both have an answer to everything off the other one uh they all ask questions that the other one answers and they have questions the other one asks this track is the answer to yum yab killers um where it is the jarbo song with the weird recording quality and the really off kilter instrumental it's like this bizarre acoustic guitar which starts with jarbo literally taking a shot of whiskey in the studio and like screaming and then she's singing this really weird vocal performance it's about expressing love in like a negative way it's really twisted it's got the sparse instrumental of this panned piano of this really metallic sounding acoustic guitar it's kind of gross on its own the song is just kind of weird and it feels almost like a demo but in the context of this album, it's it's an answer to Yum Yab. It's just, it, it, it's it's gross. And next is the song Minus Something, which is really cool. It has these droning, cold, alien textures to it. It actually has the same voice as the sex worker off of The Beautiful Days, which is the answer to that one. She shows her life struggle that her life is missing something. And the instrumental afterward is actually really creative. It like actively struggles to be melodic. It's like falling apart. It really hurts to listen to. And up next is the song Empathy which is about a disgusting, incestuous, codependent relationship. Admittedly, the song is better out of context. It kind of works with the whole soundtracks for the blind thing. It's a cool one, though, because it's about neither party being in the right. It sounds uh, very normal, though, like too normal. It's as close to like regular post-punk as Swans has gotten since like pre-Swans. And up next is the song I Love You This Much. You get these sort of lo-fi synths that get cut by these huge loud drones. It is a song that is so uncomfortable I would compare it to being blackout drunk and vomiting by yourself. It's cool because it's actually rather reflective of earlier tracks and at the same time you don't feel a bit of love here. It feels like one of the most hateful ugly tracks on the album. And up next is the song YRP you know, your property. It is over seven minutes long and sounds way different than the version from Cop. It has very quiet guitar and Jarbo singing over it, actually singing. It weighs on the listener like a stone. It has a slow yet repetitive and intense groove, which Late Swans is really known for. This is kind of indicative of what they do in like 15 years time. And this goes in the song known as Fans Lament. I swear, we're like not that far off from the end of this album. There are a few more tracks, which really just feels like a follow-up to Blood section, but it feels very weird. In fact, it might have been cut from the same recording. And this goes in the song Secret Friends, which has these weird droney synths that fade into a cool acoustic section, which goes into the song The Final Sacrifice, the last long song here, one that's kind of reflective of Animus, um, and also kind of reflective of uh, Blood Sacrifice, off of um, Great Annihilator. But this one is far dronier and more bizarre. It's also a live recording. And it's actually uh, a track that Michael Jira and Jarbo had on a project called Skin, which they did before. But that version was much shorter. This one's 10 minutes long. It has these warbling chimes and sparse percussion. It is drony and weird and bizarre, especially for the tail end of this album. It is slow, sparse, and wobbling, but altogether completely ethereal. It is like one of the haziest, like hardest to hold on to tracks. And this takes us into YRP2, which is taken from the same cut of YRP. Like YRP, it has these really hard hits, pounding and Jarbo vocalizing. It's cut from the same thing. It's used to just bookend this thing. And this takes us into the very final track, The Surrogate Drone. It's a good little two minute conclusion, just this droning goodbye to the whole thing. And this leads me to talk about the album as a whole I'll try my best to be brief. This thing is hell. It is more of an experiment than anything. It's simply how can you summarize people's lives in a single album? And it's not pretty at all. It's not even pretty from a critic standpoint. You know, it, this thing comes out cut up, dejected, dilapidated. This thing feels ruined and broken and like demos stitched together. It's literally demos stitched together at some point. And yet, undeniably, Swans have several of their finest songs on here, at least until the 2010s, dude. Like, the sound and Helpless Child alone could carry an album, and it, it doesn't here. There are plenty of great songs, like All Lined Up is fantastic. I love I Was Prisoner in Your Skull. Um, several of the drone tracks are great. Several of them I could totally do without. This thing makes you really stare at yourself. Uh, it makes you kind of realize some things about yourself, but it is very dark, uh, very horrible. Um, but very unique. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on. It's very interesting. Uh, and it's last jar. It's the last Jarbo studio performance with the band until she shows up on the Seer 
later, but you can't really recognize her there. But it's a deeply flawed record, and that's kind of why people love it so much. Uh, but it is not a 10 out of 10 album. But what might be a 10 out of 10 album is Swans Are Dead. This one is another huge double-length one. I believe it's shorter than Soundtracks for the Blind. It's actually about a similar length. Both are two hours and 20 minutes, roughly. Um, but... Swans Are Dead is really interesting because the two discs, the second one actually comes before. It was from a previous recording. Now, it's it's pretty different from Soundtracks for the Blind, even though this is the only live material we'll hear from that era. You have, instead of all the interlude tracks, you have these lumbering, extended, and devastating versions of what existed not only on Soundtracks for the Blind, but from several other albums. For example, this version of I Crawled, which shows up on the Young God EP, has Jarbo singing. It is beautiful. And another thing, this album is uh, texturally consistent. All these songs sound like they're from the same recording session, which uh, it, it's not even like the songs are produced differently. It's literally from the same concert. It is heavy for sure, but it's not as loud as the other live concerts. But at the same time, it's it almost feels heavier. And as amazing as this thing is conceptually, it's also just performed excellently. Both Michael and Jarbo have some of their best vocal performances ever. They sound like good singers. Like Jarbo has points of sounding utterly savage and Michael Jura sounds utterly dejected. It's very interesting. And most of these tracks actually don't even show up really. Or if they do, they're just under a totally different name. But what's here is really cool. Um, easy highlight is the end of the 97 tour. There is a Blood Sacrifice, which is a track off of The Great Annihilator, extended to like 15 minutes. And it is given the final era swans post-rock treatment it is turned into just a destructive force it is one of the best swans tracks this version of blood promise and uh the second half here which is actually the 1995 recording features uh, various recordings from the soundtracks for the blind era um including a even dronier even noisier version of the sound which includes uh once it hits the climax it just drones and thickens up just the percussion drops off until the whole thing comes back into itself. And this version of All Lined Up might be the best one ever. It is so minimal in effects, but with this lo-fi recording, the guitars are just wailing. You know Norman Westberg had a field day here. Um, it is just one of the heaviest tracks that Swans has ever done. And there are three Jarbo tracks here actually in a row. Like uh, there's one called Lavender, which is just never shows up again. It's a very clean, melodic track that Jarbo does. It sounds great. There's a version of YRP, and then there's a version of Yum Yab, which is actually cleaner than the one on Soundtracks for the Blind, for some reason. In my opinion, this is the quintessential Swans release of their career so far. And it just so happens to be the last one they do. This is one of my favorite live albums ever. It's, you could argue it's one of my favorite albums ever. It is, it's something I need a good copy of because I got Soundtracks of the Blind on CD, but I, I would get this on vinyl, honestly. It is a horrible, horrifying f force. I didn't even mention there's a version of Helpless Child on the second half of this one here, but everything here is insane. It sounds so crazy, it's so destructive, and yet it's so personal and amazing. It's turning a leaf for the band, and then they quit. They actually quit. Until next year, we'll be talking about the newest incarnation of Swans next year. Maybe, if I'm lucky, I'll have listened to the various other projects they've done and like give them a brief mention, but I don't really want to. So that all being said, you know, uh, yeah, support Swans. Support Michael Jira. Support these dudes, man. This music is so incredible. Um, truly one of the best listenings I've ever gone through and I cannot wait to talk about the rest of their stuff I cannot wait to listen to all that stuff um, the only thing is I need to purchase some live albums because they're not really available on streaming and I thought I might as well do that and also maybe I'll watch a documentary and maybe have some sort of supplementary video for the series that just talks about swans in general but yeah that's, uh, that's about it one more time Jennifer made this thumbnail link in the description below please support local artists just as much as you support swans because they deserve your attention and your love and your money and i don't but i would love a like and a subscribe and a comments question or concern down below in the comment section also my social media is in the description if you're interested in my my instagram or my x or my discord where we actually talk about all sorts of things um other than that it's about 
that's about it. Hope you guys are having a better day than me after listening to Swans. But uh, you guys have a good one. Bye.